Welcome, everybody, to the Fantasy Football Swagger Show. It is October 10th, 2015, Saturday evening. I am recording this podcast, guys. Glad you can join me tonight, and uh, very, very excited to have another week of fantasy football to discuss some fun stuff today on the show. I'm going to be asking our fantasy question of the day. We're going to do a quick Colts-Texans recap as well. We'll talk a little bit about some controversy regarding the Seahawks-Lions fumble at the end of Monday night's game, and it's not the controversy that you're thinking. It's not regarding the actual you know, decision that was made on the field regarding the ruling. It's It has to do with fantasy football specifically, so we'll talk a little bit about that later in the show, and I'm going to talk to you guys as well about some of my top buy, sell, and hold players here in week five of the fantasy football season, so thank you guys again for all the support, hope you enjoy the show, and let's get into it. Alright everybody, welcome back and let's start things off today with our fantasy football question of the day. And guys, I want you to do me a favor. When you're listening to the show, help me out. Like this video if you would. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, but help me out as well. I want you guys to answer the fantasy question of the day. And today's fantasy question has to do with your biggest disappointment through the first four weeks of of the NFL season. So we're talking about fantasy football disappointments. And I I don't want to hear Des Bryant. Uh, I don't want to hear other guys that have gotten injured if possible. You know, we can talk about guys that are kind of banged up that have hurt you. You know, things like Andrew Luck, you know, or, uh, you know, things like that. But I I think the the real thing that we want to talk about here, if we can, and, and really focus on this, is players who we expected more out of, who are on the field and in our fantasy lineups, but are not producing. Because I always talk about this. I would much rather have my player be injured. I would much rather right now have Des Bryant than another guy like, let's say, a CJ Anderson, who you drafted probably around the same range, who you've been putting in your lineup these past couple of weeks, and he's been absolutely destroying you and not getting you any points. Because basically, what's happening with Des Bryant is that at least you can put in somebody else. You know, at least you can go out there and pick up an Alan Hearns, or you can go out there and, you know, pick up somebody else to fill in in your flex, maybe potentially uh, upgrade one of your wide receivers from your bench to your starting lineup, and then, you know, move what would have been Des Bryant into your flex and replace him with a running back, or, you know, something like that. But, uh, you know, it's it's stuff like this that I, I think it's really important that we focus on the guys who have been disappointing. And, um, you know, I want to hear from you guys. Who have been the most disappointing players to you in your fantasy football leagues this season? You know, I'm, I'm in a ton of leagues. I'm actually in nine pay leagues, so leagues that are for money. And I know that's a ton for people, and I understand it's, it's an addiction to some extent. But, hey, if you're winning more than you're losing, that's really what counts, right? And uh, at the end of the day, that is true. For the most part, I do win more than I lose in fantasy football. Of course, there's still luck involved, but... You know, I pretty much, given the fact that I'm in so many leagues, I have a share of almost everybody in fantasy football this year. You know, there are a couple of guys who I just thought were getting drafted way too high and I I didn't get them. Uh, But, you know, for the most part, I'm out here getting, you know, the guys like the CJ Andersons, the Jeremy Hills. I have Andrew Luck. Uh, You know, guys like this that have been disappointing. Devontae Adams has been one. Uh, To me, the big one potentially, though, uh, that I think has been one of the biggest disappointments to me so far this season has been Jordan Matthews. Now, Jordan Matthews did have a nice game in week one. Uh, very nice game. I think he had uh, 12 catches, or it was either 10 or 12 catches for 120, 100 yards, somewhere in that range, trying to remember the exact number. But basically, it translated to about a 22-point day in uh, standard scoring fantasy leagues. And basically, uh, you know, ever since that point, he's basically seen his production drop. He did score a touchdown in week two. But over the past couple of weeks, we've seen him really drop down to basically being pretty much as far as fantasy goes, a wide receiver three-level player. Now, I'm not going to say that he is going to continue at that type of pace where he's only producing those type of numbers on a week-to-week basis, but it is important that we look at this situation. We say, look, in the first couple of weeks of the season, the Eagles' offense looked absolutely terrible, and that's when Jordan Matthews was producing his best numbers, sadly enough. Over the past couple of weeks, they've looked better, but Jordan Matthews is producing less. 
it's very, very odd. It's, it's a weird dynamic that we have there in Philadelphia because, like I said, their offenses look better, and their top player, their top fantasy player anyway, has been disappointing. So, uh, you know, it's it's a weird situation, but I still think Jordan Matthews is the kind of guy that can turn it around. He's only in his second year. It could be, it could be a sophomore slump that we're seeing, but again, he started the season off strong, so I do expect that he will get back in there. I do expect that there will be nice fantasy production from Jordan Matthews through the second half of the season and really through the remainder of the first half of the season. I do expect him to turn it around. But right now, man, it's been brutal the past couple of weeks. We're, we're not getting those numbers that we would have expected out of him. And I'm really hoping that he can turn it around. I know he's got he's had a couple of tough matchups, but still, it's been a little bit disappointing. C.J. Anderson, of course, is another one. I think you know anybody that has C.J. Anderson right now it has to be... It has to be probably the most disappointing player in fantasy football this season so far, uh, you know, aside from the injuries. And Anderson, he's he's suffered a little bit of an injury himself too, so you know, there's there's something to be said about that, of course. But I mean, the guy, even when he's been healthy, hasn't produced even RB two numbers yet this season. He's been really really bad. No PPR value, pretty much. Uh, no extra PPR value, I should say. Uh, the touchdowns haven't been there. Frankly, the Denver offense has pretty much been Peyton Manning throwing the football to Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas, and that's been about it. Ronnie Hillman breaking off a couple of runs here or there, but yeah, CJ Anderson, I think uh, right now has been the most disappointing player to me, but again, I want to hear from you guys. Jordan Matthews, uh, CJ Anderson have been the two for me, and maybe Ryan Tannehill to some extent, but I didn't invest a whole lot in Ryan Tannehill, so it kind of makes it a little bit easier for me to withstand that type of a blow because I can go out there and pick up, you know, a Carson Palmer when he was available in a couple of leagues. You can go out there and pick up an Andy Dalton, uh, you know, some of these guys, Tyrod Taylor, that have looked pretty good through the first couple of weeks of the season. You can bench your Sam Bradfords, your Ryan Tannehills for those guys. So I don't find them to be that disappointing personally, uh, but it is certainly true that Tannehill's been a little bit disappointing this year, as has, of course, Sam Bradford. Again, let me know, though, in the comments section below if you guys can help me out. Who was your biggest disappointment through the first quarter of the NFL season? And yes, guys, we're already through the first quarter of the fantasy season at least. We've only got, what, 11 weeks left of the regular season uh, as far as most teams go right now. Uh, 12 weeks, I, I should say, for uh, for most teams, actually, excuse me. But uh, for the fantasy season, the regular season, we're only talking about another 10 weeks before you start to get to your playoffs. Even some leagues do it a week early, so you could be only talking about nine more games we got to go out there. we got to get some wins, man. So I'm going to help you guys out. We're going to talk a little bit about you know some players that you can acquire on your team a little bit later in the show that might be able to help you out. But up next, I want to talk about the Indianapolis Colts and the Houston Texans from Thursday Night Football. This was a really boring game for the most part. And I think that a lot of that had to do, of course, with the fact that neither team really has much at the quarterback position right now. Andrew Luck, out for the second straight game for the Colts. Really disappointing, uh, you know, for his fantasy players, of course, and disappointing as well for the fantasy owners of his wide receivers. We see Dante Moncrief only catch one pass for three yards. Huge disappointment. He had what we would have expected to be a really nice matchup against the Texans defense that has struggled against wide receivers. T.Y. Hilton, five catches, 88 yards. Solid day. You know, nothing spectacular, but We'll take 88 yards and five catches. That's a, a what a 13.8 point fantasy day in uh, a PPR league. No touchdown, unfortunately. But guy who did step up, Andre Johnson, six catches, 77 yards, two touchdowns. Interesting situation there with him because uh, you know it's it's going to be really difficult right now to to not expect Andre Johnson to become a more valued asset here in the Indianapolis offense over the next couple of weeks. But at the same time, he's been so disappointing for the first few weeks of the season. I mean, he could be a year guy that we talked about before, the most disappointing player through the first four weeks of the season. I bet there are a lot of people out there who Andre Johnson has been that guy for them. They expected Andre to come in and be a wide receiver too for them, just like the, the Colts did. They expected Andre Johnson would come in there and be that wide receiver too. He has certainly not been that thus far. And uh, that's been a little bit disappointing for Indianapolis as well as for fantasy owners. So it's nice to see him catch those six passes for 77 yards and two touchdowns. Now, the tight ends there in Indianapolis didn't really do a whole lot under Matt Hasselbeck. Uh, two catches, you know, and, and one catch, not really much. Kobe Fleener did have an opportunity in the red zone, wasn't able to come up with the catch for a touchdown on a, a simple fade route. But look, Matt Hasselbeck, efficient. Nothing spectacular for fantasy. 18 of 29, 213 yards, two touchdowns, 
no picks. That's really what you look for as an NFL team. It's not really what we're hoping for from a fantasy standpoint, though. Uh, and I understand Houston has some good defensive linemen. They've got J.J. Watt, of course. Uh, you know, and and it's it's difficult to sometimes get those passes down the field. But I just don't see Matt Hasselbeck doing that. And unless Andrew Luck comes back, this is going to be a very hit or miss fantasy football wide receiver situation. There are going to be weeks probably, and we don't know. Again, Andrew Luck could be back next week, but if he's not, we could very well see a complete switch. We could see Andre Johnson catch one pass for three yards, and we could see uh, you know Dante Moncrief come out there and catch five passes for 80 yards and a touchdown, and T.Y. Hilton get three catches for 40 yards or you know something like that. And there's really not going to be a whole lot of consistency, in my opinion, in this offense. Uh, Matt Hasselbeck never really been a guy that's hit up his tight ends very much. So that hurts, of course, the the Kobe Fleeners and the Dwayne Allens of the world, who are a borderline fantasy starter at best at this point anyway. Uh, but under Matt Hasselbeck, this offense just doesn't look like the standard uh, Indianapolis offense that we've come to see over the past couple of seasons where it's been Andrew Luck just chucking the ball down the field. They really relied a lot on Frank Gore, and we'll talk about Frank Gore a little bit later uh, in our buy, sell, and hold column. I'll talk to you guys about how I feel about Frank Gore, but the reality of the situation is with Matt Hasselbeck at quarterback right now and him not really able to extend the field and bomb it down the field, they really do have to rely a lot on Frank Gore and this running game. And I'm not sure necessarily that Gore is built to sustain that for an entire season at his age. But hey, for one game, he put up solid fantasy numbers. If you had him in there, you were happy with what he produced. He had a really nice fantasy day, and he was really the star of the day as far as fantasy goes, other than maybe Andre Johnson, if you were gutsy enough to put him in after three disappointing games that he had, um, or four disappointing games, frankly. So... Uh, let's talk a little bit about the other side of the football, though. Brian Hoyer stepped in for Ryan Mallett, who got injured early in the game. Mallett was looking okay, not really moving the football down the field too much, but you know he made a couple of really nice throws. Unfortunately, he did get hurt in the game. He came out for a play, basically. He was play- he was wanting to go back out there after, I think, maybe one or two plays. But Brian Hoyer was looking really, really good. And uh, quite frankly, Brian Hoyer stole back his job. This was a guy who lost his job early in the season, and it's a really, really weird dynamic that they have there in Houston right now at the quarterback position, because you could see it visually on Ryan Mallett's face that he was pissed. The guy was visually upset that Brian Hoyer was back on the field. The Texans obviously didn't win the game, so that's a little bit of a disappointment for them at home. But look, Hoyer, 24 of 31, 312 yards, two touchdowns. Did throw an interception, but from a fantasy standpoint, really nice game. Obviously, I can't imagine that anyone had him in their lineups, given the fact that he was a backup quarterback coming into the game. You know, if you, unless you were in an absolutely desperate, like a 20-team, a two-quarterback league, maybe there's somebody out there that had him in their lineup, but he didn't do much for you uh, from, uh, you know, if you, if you had him on your roster and you didn't play him, obviously. But he does bring an interesting... Uh, an interesting situation there in Houston because I kind of feel like they might be a little bit more willing to throw the ball under Brian Hoyer than they were under Ryan Mallett. And that could hurt Arian Foster, who ran, who rushed for 19 attempts for only 41 yards. That's about a roughly a two-yard per carry average. That's really, really bad. Now, their offensive line looked horrible in this game, even against a mediocre Indianapolis defensive line. But still, nine catches, 77 yards for Arian Foster. He got it done. At the end of the day, he had, what, uh, 118 yards, no touchdowns, but hey, 118 yards, especially in the PPR league with nine catches, we are more than happy with that. That is a nice fantasy performance in a PPR league, and even in a standard league, it's decent enough. So I think Arian Foster is back to getting, you know, his usual reps there at running back. I don't expect Alfred Blue to have a whole lot of touches going forward. They might mix him in here and there to try and keep Foster healthy, but Uh, For the most part, this will be the Arian Foster show there in Houston. But again, maybe a little bit more pass happy with Hoyer than they were under Ryan Mallett. We'll see what happens out there on the field, but uh, could be a little bit of uh, an interesting situation there for Foster owners in PPR leagues. You might have just a little bit of extra bonus value there. Now, one guy that I, uh, I really am coming to fully love right now, and I wish that I had invested in him more. I wish that I had believed what was gonna happen there in Houston. But look, DeAndre Hopkins right now might be the number one or at worst the number two or three fantasy wide receiver in the league right now. 
I mean, this guy's putting up ridiculous numbers. 169 yards on 11 catches this past week on Thursday Night Football. 61 targets on the year. That is the most currently in the league. Now, granted, he does have an extra game on everybody else, but he's 9 ahead of Julio Jones and 11 ahead of Demarius Thomas, who are 2nd and 3rd on that list. So it's very, very possible that after 5 weeks of the NFL season, your target leader in the NFL could be DeAndre Hopkins. And I'm telling you guys, I've talked about this many, many times. Targets are king in fantasy football. You don't get points for targets, obviously, but the more that your team is targeting you, the better opportunity that you have. So when I see guys like a James Jones, like a Travis Benjamin through the first three weeks of the season who are catching these touchdowns 60 yards down the field on five targets, you know, it's two catches, 100 yards, and uh, two touchdowns for Travis Benjamin. That's not really what his stat line was, but basically that's what he had. And, uh, you know, on three, four, five targets, I don't see that as sustainable. Whereas I look at DeAndre Hopkins and I see him getting targeted 12 to 15 times a game every single week. And look, the guy's putting up numbers every single game. When you're targeted that often, even if you only connect on half of those passes, what is that? Still seven, eight, nine catches a game? That's crazy. Those are huge numbers. So if Hopkins continues to get targeted even close to this amount, he is going to finish as a top five fantasy wide receiver, especially in PPR leagues, because he's just putting up crazy catches and he's going to continue to do it, in my opinion. You got to go out there and you if there is an owner right now who's trying to sell high on DeAndre Hopkins, be a buyer. Sell off. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I would trade Odell Beckham Jr. for DeAndre Hopkins right now without question. I would trade... Um, other wide receivers that you were you were taking up there in that range, uh, you know, a Randall Cobb, I think easily right now. I'd rather have DeAndre Hopkins, and these are not statements of that I dislike Randall Cobb or that I dislike dislike Odell Beckham Jr. But at the moment, right now, DeAndre Hopkins is putting up better numbers, frankly, and it's more sustainable numbers as well. I, I still like Randall Cobb. I still like Odell Beckham Jr. There's, I still think that they both finish as top receivers. But right now, if you can go out there and you can get DeAndre Hopkins for anything other than an elite wide receiver, an elite running back, uh, I would do it. If you can package up a deal, if you can trade Larry Fitzgerald and, you know, a a mid-level running back or something like that. And, And granted, I like Larry Fitzgerald as well for the remainder of the season. He's done great so far. But look, I love DeAndre Hopkins and what he's doing there in Houston right now. I think of him as an elite wide receiver. He's an every week starter, regardless of the situation that you're in right now. I don't care who he's up against. You're putting him in your lineup every single week. There aren't great cornerbacks in this division right now. Vontae Davis is really the best, I would probably say, in that division. And Vontae Davis missed the game, obviously, against Houston. You don't get points for trading for him now for that, but still... You look at it and, and it's just, it's a great situation right now for DeAndre Hopkins with nobody else really developing as a, a number two wide receiver even there right now. And Hopkins is just going to continue to get targeted and targeted and targeted. He is a true target monster and that's what we love here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Show. It, it's those guys that get targeted. Those are the guys that are going to continue to produce huge numbers. Now, another guy who had a great game in his debut, Jalen Strong. His first opportunity for playing time makes two catches, both of them for touchdowns. Again, unsustainable, Uh, just like I talked about before. These are the types of things where if you can sell a guy, if you had him on your roster for whatever reason, you have a deep bench or something like that, and somebody's willing to give you something of value for Jalen Strong, I would absolutely do it. Uh, You know, Nate Washington missed this past week's game. He missed Thursday night, and there's no reason to think that when he gets back that he's not going to be a valuable asset for this fantasy or for this team on an NFL offense anyway. Uh, From a fantasy standpoint, who knows with him, but I still think that Jalen Strong is not somebody that is going to be a a guy that continues to produce those type of numbers, obviously. I I think he's got talent, not that kind of talent though. So if you can trade him off and get something decent, go ahead and do it. If he's on your waiver wire, you can consider picking him up. I think if you're in a deep league, especially if you're in a dynasty league, if he's available, go ahead and pick him up and see what happens. But uh, I wouldn't expect a whole lot from him. I wouldn't start him next week, for example. I want to see more from him before I'm willing to even consider putting him in my fantasy lineup. Unless I'm in like a 16-team league and I need a flex or something like that, then you know maybe I'll roll the dice on him. But other than that, I'm not taking a chance on Jalen Strong right now. So that's it as far as the Thursday Night Football recap goes. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about another situation here. Uh, This is something that 
I believe is getting pushed under the radar for some reason on fantasy shows. I haven't really heard of anybody address this issue. Now, I could be wrong. I don't listen to every fantasy show. I don't listen to uh, every NFL show. But from a specific fantasy standpoint, I believe that this is something that we have to look into a little bit further. So at the end of the Monday Night Football game, We all have seen it. Calvin Johnson fumbled. Cam Chancellor knocked the ball away. K.J. Wright batted it out of the back of the end zone. It should have been ruled illegal batting in the NFL as far as the rule is written. It was not. So whatever, right? Okay, we understand, obviously, it was a bad call. The Lions probably got screwed. But at the same time, in my opinion, Calvin Johnson can't fumble there. And that's coming from somebody who's Calvin Johnson is my favorite NFL player. Uh, But look, Calvin can't fumble there. Regardless, though. I don't want to talk about the actual penalty that should have occurred. I want to talk about how it was actually scored. So as far as the NFL statisticians go, it was ruled as a fumble by Calvin Johnson with no recovery by the defense. So it's important that we actually look at how this was scored because basically there is a difference right now in opinion on how this is being scored for fantasy. Now, most websites, including NFL.com, ESPN.com, and others, are using the official NFL scoring, which was, again, that Calvin Johnson fumbled, so he lost points for that. The defense might have forced a fumble, which for some you know scoring systems does actually matter, but they never recovered the fumble. They, fumble. they never had actual possession. They batted it out of the end zone. So, For most websites, again, NFL.com, ESPN.com, My Fantasy League, all these big sites, they're not ruling that as a fumble recovery. However, Yahoo Fantasy Sports is ruling it as a fumble recovery for the Seattle defense. Now, this is extremely important, again, because they're getting extra points for something that, from an NFL standpoint, was not ruled as a fumble recovery. So they're actually going against the official NFL scoring of that individual play. Now, this is important to consider because Yahoo actually uses an independent statistician called Stat LLC. They're a Chicago-based company, pretty well-known in the fantasy community. But the bottom line is that Stat LLC is not the NFL. They go with their own stats. Now, for the most part, they match up 99.99% of the time with the NFL ruling. But in this case, they do go against what the NFL official ruling was. So they are, Stat LLC ruled this as a fumble recovery. So Yahoo, in turn, gave those fantasy points to the owners of the, the Seattle defense. Now, it's what's really interesting here is that Stat LLC is an independent company. Like I said, they're, they're not owned by Yahoo, as far as I understand it. They're an independent company that Yahoo uses. But they actually do not reply to you know, questions when people ask them about their employees engaging in daily fantasy sports themselves. So, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but there is a little bit of a controversy going around. I'm sure if you're, if you pay close attention to fantasy football, you probably heard there was a controversy of DraftKings employees actually going and playing daily fantasy sports themselves, not on DraftKings, but on FanDuel. And, uh, you know, obviously FanDuel and DraftKings being the two big dogs in the market, They were taking the information that they had on DraftKings, which had to do with especially the particular thing was ownership percentage. So let's say, for example, uh, we're talking about Carlos Hyde, for example, as as a player. Uh, They actually can go in and see in their software how much, how how often is Carlos Hyde being owned in fantasy leagues? Because we don't have the access to that information as standard players until kickoff, right? So uh, it's important because they know the players that are owned at a really high rate or owned at a really low rate. And actually to win a lot of these huge tournaments, the millionaire makers, the, you know, the big ones with the massive payouts, most of the time, the players that win those are players who have low owned players that really go off. So, you know, if you had Devonta Freeman a couple of weeks ago and he was only owned in 5% of leagues and he went off for three touchdowns, Obviously, that's going to help you a lot if you're going up against people that don't have Devonta Freeman in their lineup. Even if the player that they have also goes off, it doesn't matter as much because they are not creating as much of a point differential between themselves and the rest of the pack. Do you get what I'm saying? Uh, the, the ownership percentages particularly matter, again, in those big tournaments because you really have to have players that other people don't have that also go off. So, again... It's not 
anything illegal at this point anyway, but it's definitely something that is controversial, controversial, excuse me. DraftKings has come out and said that, you know, they're not going to allow their, their, uh, their employees to play on any other daily fantasy sports site either. They already didn't allow them to play on DraftKings. So that's good, obviously, but, uh, that would have been really, really bad if they were doing that. But anyway, uh, so there is controversy with daily fantasy sports, but this is another example of more controversy with daily fantasy sports because Yahoo themselves does have a daily fantasy sports website as well. And Stat LLC, again, goes along with the daily fantasy sports statisticians at Stat LLC. So it's very unfortunate because what's basically happening here, as far as I understand it, is that Yahoo is not going back and retroactively changing the scoring scoring on uh, their, you know, their, their regular fantasy website because of what happened with daily and it's it's a really really weird thing right now uh we unfortunately don't have time in daily fantasy sports to go back and change the scoring especially on a monday night game you know it could potentially happen on say a sunday night game for you know where there's still another game to happen and maybe during the day on monday we find out oh the nfl came out and ruled that you know, this play was a fumble or whatever, right? And, uh, you know, when that kind of thing does happen, there is time for them to do it. But on a Monday night game, basically, as soon as the Monday night game's over, the scores are final. And that's really important for daily fantasy sports because obviously FanDuel, DraftKings, these other sites, they kind of pride themselves on paying you as soon as the games are over. And if they don't pay you as soon as the games are over, people aren't going to play there. So it's a really tough situation to put these sites in, and Yahoo's in a really interesting situation because they obviously have their weekly fantasy sports, which is, you know, their commissioner style, the traditional fantasy sports, and then they have daily. So it's kind of weird because they can actually go back and change the the commissioner style scoring because they're not paying out to that. But their daily game, they do pay out to. So it, it's it's a really odd situation. It's It also brings to light why maybe some of these sites shouldn't do both. Or if they're going to, they need to really define what and how they're going to you know score things to people. Because again, the official NFL ruling said that that was not a fumble recovery. But right now, somebody could have won money on their daily site due to the incorrect scoring of Stat LLC. So just keep that stuff in mind, guys. Bottom line here is that the stat corrections are something, again, that can happen uh, from a week-to-week game, such as Derek Carr and Latavius Murray. If you guys don't know, on Yahoo, they were scored slightly incorrectly. Uh, A fumble, I think, was given to Latavius Murray that was actually Derek Carr. It was ruled as a Derek Carr fumble. Um, It was a handoff um, muff, I'm sure. I don't remember the exact play, but something like that. And basically, they went back and fixed the scoring. So Derek Carr got some negative points, and I think Latavia Murray got a couple of points added on to his score. That could have changed the records that some people had. Some people might have walked out with a win or a loss on, uh, you know, after the game, and then on Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, whenever it was changed, they came to the, the their league page and look, I have an extra win suddenly. What? You know, stuff like that can happen in in, in non daily fantasy sports, but in daily, again. It does change a lot. So I think there's some controversy here and something to just keep in mind, guys. At the end of the day, my personal opinion is that what should be the ruling is the official NFL ruling. And if we have to wait for a certain reason to to pay out, these websites should do it. And they, I mean, it's going to be a rare circumstance that something like this happens. And it would be better for them to get it right than to, you know, take a chance on something being incorrect and, you know, costing people money and, and potentially getting sued over it, you know, all these different types of things that could, you know, hypothetically come up. Bottom line, uh, I think the best course of action for commissioners right now might be a, li- a line in your rule book that basically says that NFL stats, official NFL stats, overrule your league software no matter how they do it most of these sites again espn and um uh, you know my fantasy league uh, nfl.com they use the official nfl statistician so it's not an, an issue but yahoo does not so if you're on a yahoo league i would recommend adding that to your rule book and saying look the commissioner after the game can go back and adjust the scoring on a certain play if stat llc Yahoo scoring uh, statisticians scored it incorrectly based on how the NFL is scoring it. That's something you can opt to do. 
I would recommend it. It's something that I would definitely do if I if I'm in a league that's on Yahoo right now. So let's move on, guys. Uh, we talked about that plenty. I think uh, we've gone over that and the controversy that happened. I want to hear what you guys have to say regarding that, by the way. If you could, comment below. Let me know what you think about that whole situation, if, if how I explained it makes sense, and if you agree with me in adding a rule in your Yahoo leagues to allow for NFL uh, stats to overrule the actual league software, the Yahoo software that you're using. Let me know, guys, in the comment section below what you think about that. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about buy, sell, and hold for week number five. These are guys that I think you should be either buying on, selling on, uh, and that means trading them away or trading for them, or if you should just hold and see what happens. Uh, Guys I talked about last week, Jeremy Hill, I talked about buying him. Three touchdowns this past week, nice game for him, obviously a little bit skewed on the touchdowns, a little higher than what we would have probably imagined him to be at. But the bottom line is that I like Jeremy Hill because I think this offense is going to score quite a few points, and I think he's going to be the guy. I talked about it going into the season. I talked about Jeremy Hill as a potential guy to lead the league in touchdowns this year from the running back position, and right now he's on pace to do it. You know, maybe he doesn't have the most touchdowns in the league, but he's definitely up there to compete for it, and that's that's really what we look for. Now, Alfred Morris is a guy that I talked about selling on. 62 yards in the win against Philly. This is not a good situation in Washington for the running backs because there's just three guys right now that are all competing for touches. None of them are getting enough to be fantasy superstars on their own. I guess Morris is probably getting the most touches, so he's probably the most valuable of the three at the moment. But what does that really mean? Again, 62 yards, no touchdown. Okay, you got six points. Alfred Morris is still not a pass catcher. He's still bad in PPR leagues, quite frankly. He's a borderline RB2 in PPR leagues. So it's not a great situation for him. I'm still looking to sell Alfred Morris for whatever you can get for him, basically, at this point. I I don't think he's more than an RB3 right now uh, in most leagues. So just, you know, keep that stuff in mind, guys. Now, uh, let's move on and talk about a couple other guys. Chris Ivory is somebody who I really invested a lot in, and I'm actually looking to kind of move him right now. I'm looking to sell him because he's looked really great when he's been healthy, and he did crush the Dolphins on Sunday. But look... (laughs) <laughs> he is, I, I like the talent. I like everything that I've seen from him, but injuries have always been the concern with Chris Ivory. This guy just cannot stay healthy. He's already missed a game. Well, actually he got injured in one game, which hurt us. And then the next week he ended up sitting out despite the fact that they said he was active. That is like the worst case scenario for fantasy owners, by the way. Uh, I, again, like I talked about in the opening of the show, I would much rather have a guy sit out so that I can put somebody else in than go out there and grade it out and get four carries for six yards. Or, you know, in his case, zero carries, zero touches. He wasn't even on the field. So stuff like that, the coaching staff makes it dangerous to own Chris Ivory right now. He could very easily get banged up again and, you know, be irrelevant. Now, we don't like to predict injuries here, but again, these are guys who have a history of nagging injuries, not, you know, he broke his ankle kind of a thing where it's like, well, you know, that can happen. He broke his collarbone or, um, you know, he tore his ACL kind of a thing. These are types of things that can happen to anybody, but it's like the little stuff that, that, his rushing style of running into guys and being a power back and really not being a huge guy to begin with, that kind of stuff can take a toll on your body. And I think that it has for Chris Ivory. So I still think that injuries are a major concern for him. The other thing is that his stats are very game flow dependent and he can easily be forgotten about in a game where the Jets fall behind multiple scores early. That team might not get him the ball more than 10 times in a game. Yeah, he's going to catch some passes, but he's still not the primary third down guy for them. And it's going to be a tough situation if they're in a game against the Patriots and the Patriots go out there and beat them, you know, 49 to 10, like they've been doing to some of these other teams. If that kind of stuff happens, it's really tough to imagine that Chris Ivory is going to have a decent fantasy day. So I think Chris Ivory right now looks like an RB1 probably not an RB1 for the remainder of the season. I do think that he's a solid RB2, and I'm happy to have him on my team. But if I can get something great in return for him, if I can go out here and get some of these other guys that we're going to talk about on actual buying, on, um, I'm probably doing it. Other guys that I want to talk about, Calvin Johnson. Right now, Calvin Johnson 
not looking good from a fantasy standpoint. His numbers just are not there. He's not putting up the huge numbers that we're accustomed to seeing from him. And, uh, you know, it's been disappointing. If, if somebody in your league right now drafted Calvin Johnson in the first round, which that does happen, he was mostly a second round pick. But there are leagues out there where people were super high on Calvin Johnson. And, and even a second round pick is, is being pretty high on the guy. And, uh, you know, right now, he is not even on the radar of being an, an, a wide receiver one. Currently, he sits behind these guys in fantasy scoring for the season and standard scoring. I'm going to name off some names and you guys are going to, your mouths are going to drop. Leonard Hankerson. He's behind Leonard Hankerson. He's behind Doug Baldwin. He's behind Darius Hayward Bay and guys like this, Ted Ginn Jr., Okay, now I understand we're four weeks into the season. This is kind of not necessarily the an indication of how things are going to be for the remainder of the season. But right now, Calvin Johnson is the R, is the wide receiver 38 in a standard scoring league. 38th ranked. But I, what I will say about Calvin Johnson right now is that he's putting up decent numbers in terms of targets. And again, we talked about targets with DeAndre Hopkins. Targets are king. He only had five targets in week one, which was a huge disappointment, obviously. And people were wondering, is Calvin Johnson going to continue to get targeted here? But look, in weeks two, three, and four, he's had 17 targets, 13 targets, and 12 targets. So if you were to actually average those out, so I'm going to do that real quickly. What does that put you at? 42, divide that by three, multiply that by six. Six, or let's let's multiply that by four since we've already had four games. He would have if if you took out week one and averaged out you know the other three games, which obviously we can't do. But just if you look at the past three games, he is on target or on pace for fifty six games through his or fifty six targets through his first four games. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting situation here because again he's getting targeted way more often than I think a lot of people believe that he is. Over the past three games, he has twenty five catches. That's not bad. In a PPR format, that's pretty darn solid. Now, we would not normally think of Calvin Johnson as being like a PPR stud or something like that. Like, I mean, these are the type of numbers that you would almost expect to see out of a Julian Edelman versus a Calvin Johnson. But hey, we'll take what we can get right now. And I still think Calvin Johnson is the big bodied playmaker type of wide receiver who can take out over a game at any point in time. So I still really do like him. He does have a tough matchup here in week five against Patrick Peterson and the Arizona Cardinals. So if you're not able to get Calvin Johnson before this weekend's games, you could potentially see him struggle this week. Maybe get five catches or something like that. Not a huge game. I don't expect him to go out there and, and dominate this week. If he does, obviously it's going to be more difficult to acquire a Calvin Johnson. But if he doesn't, if he goes, just goes out there and has his standard type of game that he's had through the first four weeks of the season, his value is going to continue to drop and you can continue to get him for less and less and less. Now, what I will say is that Calvin's schedule coming up looks pretty nice. Chicago, Minnesota, Kansas City, the worst defense against wide receivers right now, Kansas City, are all coming up. And then in the playoffs, he's got New Orleans and San Francisco, who both look really, really shaky in their secondaries as well. So I think this is a great buy low opportunity for Calvin Johnson, who is normally considered to be an elite wide receiver. Now, another wide receiver who I'm looking at as a potential sell high is actually Vincent Jackson. Vincent Jackson, almost the opposite of Calvin Johnson right now in that he uh, he had one big game um, with the 10 catches for 147 yards this past week against Carolina. Big, big game for him. And I think that's kind of going to be an aberration. I don't expect him to continue at that type of pace. Josh Norman, the great cornerback for the Carolina Panthers, was actually on Mike Evans for a lot of the day, and and he took away a few passes that went toward Evans. And also, I think he was just in great coverage, so Evans wasn't getting targeted as often as he normally would. Vincent Jackson obviously had an easier matchup throughout the, the majority of the day, and they were able to target him more and more. So I think Jackson still remains a very boom or bust type of player, one of the biggest boom or bust type players in the NFL. Only other guy that I can think of is of more of a boomer bust is probably uh you know Deshaun Jackson maybe. But other than him, Vincent Jackson is a guy who's just super inconsistent. He has these huge games and then he does nothing for big periods of time. He had 10 games of his in his past 36 with double digit points in a standard league. So, think about this. Double digit points is basically uh if you're in a standard league, 40 yards and a touchdown is is a 10 point fantasy day he's only had 10 of those in his past 36 games that stretches over two seasons that's that's two seasons it's it's 2013 2014 and the first four games of this year he's only had 10 games during that entire stretch with 10 or more points that's not good 
So uh, just keep that stuff in mind, guys. I think Vincent Jackson, again, and, and again, in those games that where he does those 10 games, I bet his numbers are gigantic because he's blowing it away. He's getting 10 catches for 147 yards, you know, uh, and scoring touchdowns too, typically. He didn't he didn't do uh, that this past week. But look, in, in a lot of these games, again, with Vincent Jackson, it's boomer bust. So he's not a great week-to-week fantasy player. He's more of a daily type of player. Uh, if you can acquire him uh, for a cheap price on a weekly format or in a daily format, excuse me, uh, where you know you're on DraftKings or something like that, and he's you see the type of matchup like he had this past week against Carolina, and you can take advantage of that. That's what you want to do with Vincent Jackson. You don't want to roll him out there every single week in your regular yearly commissioner style fantasy league because he just doesn't produce those consistent numbers. So again, I'm looking to sell off Vincent Jackson. Now, another guy I'm actually looking to buy is Antonio Gates, tight end. San Diego Chargers coming off of a four-game suspension. He's going to be back this week. We haven't seen him play yet this season, but quietly, Antonio Gates was the number two fantasy wide or fantasy tight end in 2014. He's a huge red zone threat still. Obviously, he doesn't have the speed that he did early in his career. But tight ends are very, very weak this season. We've seen a couple of guys. We've seen Travis Kelsey, Greg Olson, obviously Rob Gronkowski put up big numbers. And Martellus Bennett to some extent. Uh, But most of these guys this year have been really hit or miss on a week-to-week basis. And that's how it's going to be throughout the remainder of the season, in my opinion. Now, when you look at a guy like Antonio Gates, you see a lot of consistency. And you see a high touchdown potential. And touchdowns from the tight end position are very, very valuable because most of these guys don't score a lot of them. Maybe they get five on the year, six on the year, and and that's a good number for a fantasy tight end. But you look at Antonio Gates and double digit touchdowns in the final 12 games of the season are not out of the question. Now, I wouldn't necessarily expect that, but it could happen. You know, we could definitely see Antonio Gates be up there in second place through the remainder of the fantasy season in terms of tight end scoring. We haven't really seen the guys like Travis Kelsey and Greg Olson and, uh, and frankly, Jimmy Graham put up huge numbers yet. So Gates could certainly be up there in that conversation through the remainder of the season. So just look at Gates as a guy that you could potentially get right now. The offense is looking good. Philip Rivers leads the NFL right now in passing yardage. Well, at least he did. No, he still he still would lead. The, yeah, even after Thursday Night Football, I'm trying to think of if the other quarterbacks would have been up there. But obviously, Hoyer and uh, Hasselbeck would not have been. So it, it is still Philip Rivers right now who is the number one quarterback in terms of yardage this season. They're throwing the ball a lot there in San Diego, and I expect that to continue. That should be a nice situation for Antonio Gates to step into, and I do think he's going to have some great value going down the stretch here. Now, another guy that I want to talk about, C.J. Anderson. I've talked about him as a buy low before, and I still believe that you could potentially buy on him. But for right now, I'm holding because I don't really love what you can get in exchange for him. You know, if you own C.J. Anderson right now, I don't think you're going to get much for him in return. You know, if you can obviously change him and exchange him for another running back who's looking good, uh, do it. But uh, I don't really think right now that you're more that you're very likely to do that. You know, if you could get a Joseph Randall for C.J. Anderson, I might do it. If you could get a uh, obviously a Devonta Freeman would be one. If you could get a Chris Ivory, uh, we talked about him as a potential sell high. But still, I think that uh, you know C.J. Anderson right now his value just isn't very good. He doesn't look great, and the running situation there in Denver just doesn't look very good in general. So. I don't love his situation. I'm not necessarily looking to buy him, but I'm also not not necessarily looking to sell him because, again, we're just not going to get a whole lot in return for him. So I want to watch and see what happens with C.J. Anderson. Maybe you don't put him in your lineup, but if you want to, I think this is an okay week to do it. Oakland is not a great defense. They've, they've looked okay at times this season, especially against bad offenses, but... C.J. Anderson absolutely destroyed the Raiders in 2014, and I understand they've made some improvements to their team, and frankly, Denver doesn't look as good this year as they did last year, at least on offense, but C.J. Anderson murdered them. Like, it was really, really bad. I mean, those were two of the biggest games that he had down the stretch were both against Oakland. So uh, this is the type of game where he could take over. Unfortunately, it could also be a nice day for Ronnie Hillman. So we've got to, we've got to kind of risk reward it here. If you, if you have somebody else who looks like they could have a nice game, go ahead and play him. But if you're looking for a boomer bust type of player in your flex, CJ Anderson is the kind of guy that I think would be okay to have in your lineup this week. But again, hold on him. Let's see what happens. And then we'll make a decision maybe after this week on term, in terms of if we should buy or sell him. Now, moving forward, I also want to talk about Andre Johnson. 
We talked a little bit about him earlier in the show about how he had a nice day, but he's still the wide receiver three in Indianapolis. And I just, I'm, I'm still looking to sell him if I can, even if he did have a nice game. Once Andrew Luck gets back, I do expect that he's going to go back to being the wide receiver three there behind Moncrief and obviously behind T.Y. Hilton. So it's not a great situation for him. He still could have some value, but Andre Johnson's never been much of a touchdown scorer. I think a lot of people have this impression of him that he's some big bodied receiver who just boxes people out and scores touchdowns like crazy. He's never, never had double digit touchdowns in the entirety of his career. And this is a Hall of Fame career. So don't think of him as a guy who's going to go out there and get you a touchdown a week, and especially not two touchdowns a week. It's not going to happen. Just keep that in mind, guys. And if you can get something good for Andre Johnson now that he's had a nice game, I would probably consider doing it. I think the multi-touchdown game is an aberration. Do not expect that to happen again, probably at all this season. Another guy that I really want to talk about here is Todd Gurley, because Todd Gurley, I think right now, is a buy option. I think you have to go out there and try and acquire him right now, especially if the owner in your league doesn't really watch the games. If there's somebody that just casually plays fantasy football, I would definitely go out there and try and get Todd Gurley right now, because... Yeah, he had a big game, but he didn't score any touchdowns. So, like, from a standard scoring league, I think he had 14 points or some, somewhere along those lines. It was a nice game, but it wasn't like Devontae Freeman's three touchdowns or something where you, it's just you can't trade for him, basically, right now. You know, you can't really trade for a Devontae Freeman. Uh, but with a Todd Gurley, I think that you can. And I think the situation is very, very good for him right now in St. Louis. Their offense is looking okay right now, to be honest with you. And really, he's going to be the workhorse in that backfield going forward. I believe anyway I I really do believe that I think that Gurley has that type of skill set and I think that they're willing to give him the ball we saw it plenty this past week and he uh he put up good numbers 140 something yards I, I don't have the stats in front of me right now but a nice day for Todd Gurley and I certainly expect him to get plenty of touches going forward and anytime that you're the bell cow running back in a Jeff Fisher offense You can have some nice fantasy value. We've seen it before with Zach Stacey. We saw it with Trey Mason last year. And Todd Gurley's very clearly the most talented of that bunch. So I would definitely be looking to go get a Todd Gurley. I don't expect him to be like a top five running back from here on out or anything like that. But maybe an RB1 going forward. We could, we'll have to see. But I definitely like what I saw against him or with him against a good Arizona defense this past week. Another guy I'm looking to buy at the running back position, Latavius Murray. Uh, I think he's a buy after this Sunday's game. Uh, He struggled in week four against Chicago, which should have been a great matchup for him. I had him as one of my top 10 running backs this past week. I think everybody did, but he he was not good. He didn't put up good numbers. And unfortunately, this week, he actually has a tough matchup again against Denver. Denver's defense might be the best in the league. So I wouldn't expect Latavius Murray's going to have a nice game this week. But I'm actually kind of telling you this one as an, an advance by low because Latavius Murray could have another poor game this week if he goes out there and rushes for 50 yards and catches, you know, a couple passes for 15, 20 yards, something like that. Uh, That's not a great fantasy day, obviously, but we would then see back-to-back disappointing fantasy days from an Oakland Raiders running back. So it's not a great situation and back-to-back games with poor performances. That's the kind of thing where your your typical fantasy owner is just going to look at that and be like, eh, maybe I don't have much here in Latavius Murray. But He's still the workhorse there, and he's being used in the passing game, so I really like him, and I just feel like the skills are there. I really do. I feel like the skills are there with Latavius Murray, and I would not be surprised to see him put up good numbers through the remainder of the season. He's going to be, again, going into his bye week after this week in Denver, so it's a good time to trade for him. I've talked about this before on the show, but but trading for guys on their bye weeks is actually kind of an interesting idea because a lot of times people become desperate, and they're like, what am I going to do right now this week? Can you trade me somebody that I can play this week? And I'm like... Yeah, man, I'll throw you, you know, somebody that's trash uh, in in exchange for Latavius Murray. You know, you put him as as a package deal. You get, you know, one of your wide receivers that's decent, that's, you know, they're okay. And a running back that's somebody that they could start this week potentially. But, you know, he's not really a superstar player. Like, let's say you you went out there and got Booby Dixon, who's probably going to start for the Bills this week. You know, you you package Booby Dixon and a wide receiver in a package for Latavius Murray. Then you're really looking at a good value in return because you're not giving up a whole lot for with Booby Dixon and you're getting a whole lot potentially with Latavius Murray. So I I would definitely recommend going out there and trying to do that. Another guy that you could consider selling right now, Frank Gore. I I mentioned before that I wanted to talk about him later uh, when we were talking about the Colts and Texans game. His great game, and I'm using quotes right now, he had a great game on Thursday night football and it was 98 yards and a touchdown. 
Uh, don't get me wrong, that's not bad by any means, but it's not like some game where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so disappointed that I didn't have Frank Gore this week. I, I wish that I would have. It's like, okay, he had a nice game. That That's fine. And most guys, he'll probably finish as close to an RB1 this week. But still, he's not a superstar running back at this point in his career. He's still barely being used as a pass catcher. So in PPR leagues, his value is a little bit weaker. And frankly, Andrew Luck's going to be back and this team's going to be back to passing the ball three out of four plays practically, you know? So I, I would not be surprised if Frank Gore takes a big step back going forward and starts to become the guy that he was through the first couple of games of the season. Uh, so if you can get something good in exchange for Frank Gore, I'd probably go out there and do it. Now, another guy that I'm holding on right now, Justin Forsett, he had his first big game of the season after three just trash performances by that offense there in Baltimore. He had 150 yards, didn't catch a pass, which is a little bit surprising for him. He still has 12 catches on the year, so I'm not really worried about that. But uh, I, I think Justin Forsett right now is uh, certainly a guy who you can hold on and and just see what's going to happen. If you've got him on your roster, great. I wouldn't be looking to trade him away. If you don't have him on your roster, I probably still want to see at least one more performance where he looks decent. Where, Frankly, where the offensive line looks decent. Because I think Forsett himself has actually looked good on the field. He's finding the holes. The problem is that the, there just weren't very many holes prior to this past week's game. So uh, again, I, I really like Justin Forsett going forward, but I still think uh, I'm not necessarily looking to go out there and acquire him just because he's coming off the nice game so you might have to pay more than you otherwise would first of all and secondly we just know don't know for certain if that game was just kind of a a weird situation or if maybe the first couple of games of the season were the weird situation and and Baltimore is going to be back to looking like they did in 2014 when they were blocking really really efficiently for four set now I think a couple of other guys on here uh, I want to talk about I just want to touch on briefly um Devonta Freeman, you know, we talked about him. I think it's very difficult right now to acquire him. I think you could sell him off and get some good value for him. I think a lot of people are viewing Devonta Freeman right now as an RB1, and he could be that going forward, but he, he does have six touchdowns over his past two games. I mean, those are monster numbers. Those are unsustainable numbers. He's not going to do that. He's not known as like a, a monster red zone running back or something like that. He's pretty much running through the middle of the offensive line and getting into the end zone on like 20 yard runs. It, it's a really bizarre situation that might not even happen again for the rest of the year. So I, I'm, I'm still... I still like Devonta Freeman, but if I can get something great in return for him, I'm probably looking to do it. I I do think that Tevin Coleman coming back is going to be a little bit of a a painful situation for Devonta Freeman. He's still going to be the guy, I think, but Tevin Coleman might be out there a little bit more often than we would otherwise like to see out of a, a, you know, a quote stud running back. He might have some competition there in the backfield. And by the way, guys, if you can hear like a baby yelling in the background, my daughter's just playing upstairs. She's just having a good time. Don't worry about it. We're, we're hanging out down here talking fantasy football and she's up there talking to mom and uh, learning how to do stuff. She's just starting to talk. So it's pretty cool, but I digress. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about fantasy football. Uh, A couple other guys here, Tavon Austin. I'm looking to sell right now. He scored two touchdowns on six catches for 98 yards in week four. And Tavon Austin has never been productive in his career so far. It's been a very disappointing top 10 pick for the uh, for the St. Louis Rams. And I still think that's probably more likely to be what we see going forward. Tavon is being used in a lot of weird gadget plays. And frankly, he has been throughout his whole career. And most of the time, they really haven't worked out. So it's surprising to me that they've kind of been able to utilize him as like a standard player a little bit more over the past couple of weeks. And maybe that gives him a little bit more life in fantasy. But the bottom line is that I still think he is, he might be a bigger boomer bust than Deshaun Jackson and Vincent Jackson, actually. Uh, But the problem is that I think there's a lot more bust than there is boom with Tavon Austin. I think you might get three games a year where he has great fantasy value, and then you might have 13 games a year where he does nothing or practically nothing from a fantasy standpoint. So just keep that stuff in mind. I would not be looking to acquire Tavon Austin right now. If he's on the waiver wire and you're in a deep league, go ahead and grab him, but don't trade for him right now. I I just, I don't think it's worth it. I don't think he's a very great player at this point in his career. He's still very small and under, uh, underwhelming, frankly, from, for what he's done. Last guy that I want to talk about, Jarvis Landry. His fantasy totals have dropped every week this season, which has been super disappointing for, from a, a Jarvis Landry fantasy owner like myself. But what I will tell you is that he's still getting targeted a ton, 
and he's had tough back-to-back matchups against the Jets and the Bills over the past two weeks. So I I definitely think that uh, Landry is somebody that you want to look at as a, I think you could potentially buy on him right now because of the back-to-back tough matchups and people might not be viewing him as a borderline wide receiver one or at least a rock solid wide receiver two. And if that's the situation, go out there and acquire him. But I would at least pay attention to what happens over these these next couple of games because he's got good matchups here. Tennessee, Houston, New England, all these defenses are not great against the pass. And I certainly think that Ryan Tannehill could get something going here against uh, some of these defenses. And we, we could certainly see Jarvis Landry come alive, especially uh, once the offense starts to be clicking a little bit more against these bad defenses. So just keep an eye on uh, Jarvis Landry. I think that he's a potential buy, but I'm probably holding on him right now. Certainly not selling Jarvis Landry right now. That would be, I think, a mistake. So That is going to do it, guys. I know this is a little bit longer episode than usual, but I hope you guys enjoyed it anyway. We talked about a lot of stuff. If you did enjoy it, do me a favor. Click that like button below. And uh, again, subscribe to the channel if you guys would as well. If you're new, I would greatly appreciate it. Let me know what you guys think about the show in the comments section below. And I want to remind you guys as well, we will be talking fantasy football tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, here live on youtube.com forward slash clickwid. I will be discussing your lineups. We'll talk about players that you should should be starting or sitting each day uh, from uh, we do it every single week so if you guys stop by and ask your fantasy questions I'll try and answer them I get to almost all of them so thank you guys for all of you who are coming by on a week-to-week basis if you would share that show too I would really appreciate it it's helping other people and I just have fun talking with you guys so thank you again so much for all the support um, one more thing guys comment below if you have any lineup questions or if you want to leave them for me on Twitter I can try to answer them there as well uh, if you can't stop by the show tomorrow I'll do my best to answer them, but I do get tweeted a lot of questions and people do leave a lot of comments here. Um, so I, I prefer to answer them live where I can help out other people as well. So, you know, just keep that in mind. But again, you can comment below or or tweet me at Click with TV and I'll try to answer them. So thanks again, guys. That's going to wrap up the show. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll talk to you guys next time here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Show. Swagger.